Erev Tov. I'm Stephen Benoon, and you're watching Israeli News Live. And we are here on top of Mount Zion here, right here, where a few years back, Pope Benedict was given an official seat, actually an official seat for the Pope of Rome here at the Tomb of David. Kind of going back into the history a little bit to look at some of these things here in light of Pope Francis visiting the United States and speaking to both houses of Congress, speaking privately to President Barack Obama and even to the United Nations at a full house. In fact, I watched the broadcast live never me and my wife both watched it live. Never have I seen the United Nations packed out so much. And, and you, you take someone like Prime Minister Netanyahu, it's just a scattered group that's in there. But with Pope Francis, he certainly had a rock star welcome, as AOL News pointed out when he was in Cuba. And here we are having, as well, in the United States, the red carpet was rolled out, and he has just incredible status, and the people just seem to love him like no other person. And if you think about just looking at the commonality of what he speaks about, he does seem like he's got some very good, valid points. But you have to look deeper, and you have to look at what really is behind the words that are being said. What the agenda is, of the Vatican to begin with. And this is where the problems come in. Like here on Mount Zion here, the Vatican was given an official seat at King David's tomb, in essence, making Pope Francis, or any pontiff for that matter, the King of Israel. And yet people wonder about the Antichrist. They say, well, he's gonna be Jewish. Here's the reason why you see the Jewish part. And of course, the connection for the Syrian side of it is Rome is, in effect, Esau and Hadad, the one surviving heir of, of Esau, actually became the king of Syria, intermarried in again, much like his father did many, many centuries before. Hadad also married in amongst the Syrians and later migrated into northern Africa, according to the rabbinical sages, and then finally into Italy, where even Obadiah, the prophet, acknowledges that Esau was alive and well. Well, Another historical thing that took place here in Israel in 2014 on Passover was that he was allowed to come up because of course Mount Zion was given to him without any referendum. He came up to the upper room and held a mass. Only men in that particular mass and Obadiah, only a one chapter book, but in verse 16 clearly speaks about Shutatetam, which is uh, they will drink, masculine plural, upon his holy mountain. It was only men that day that drank right here, just meters away from where I'm at, sitting here next to the wall here, close to uh, Zion's gate here. But they had the mass there, and it was men only, just as the verse in verse 16 declares. Ishatu, it says, as you go further into the verse, and they shall continually drink, gender inclusive, both men and women. And the following weeks thereafter, speaks of the goim of the nations, they would continually drink and they will swallow down, as Obadiah brings out. And the nations from around the world, the people that are Catholic, the Goim, the Gentiles, have been drinking here on God's holy mountain, Mount Zion. Prophecy being fulfilled right before your eyes. And then we look back in history and we see that Shimon Perez made a deal in 1993. It was brought out by Joel Boehner, the, the late Joel Boehnerman, the journalist, Israeli journalist, investigative journalist, as well as Barry Chamish, exposing the Vatican's plan to internationalize Jerusalem. And only recently, in an article on Israel National News, in an op-ed, Guglio Miotti, the Italian journalist, brings out how that what the deal is being done back in 2000 with Rome and Israel here, that they have basically, in effect, opened the ability to be able to uh, take the Jews out of Jerusalem and make them live elsewhere. Speaking about East Jerusalem, that it would become a Palestinian area and even possibly a Palestinian capital. Of course, the Palestinian people, or the Arabic people that live here, mostly in the West Bank, but also in amongst the Jewish people of the nation. But this is only stirring more problems and as well fulfilling more prophecy. Because we find out in Micah chapter 4, God asks a very interesting question. He asks Israel around verse 9, is there no king in thee? You see, God knows that Israel 
made a mistake years ago in rejecting Samuel the prophet and wanting a king. Well, they did get some good kings. They got a David. They got, they got Solomon. Of course, Solomon backslid later. Led Israel a little bit into idolatry. And of course, Ahab brought Jezebel right into Israel, brought completely nothing but a Babylonian kingdom into the country. Well, finally, God sent deliverance. But Israel rejected that as well. And in 70 AD, Titus, the Roman general, one of Esau's own descendants, came down, united with the Syrians, because they already had a marriage to begin with, and overthrew the city here, destroyed the second temple. But now we're looking at Micah's prophecy. And Micah goes on to say, after God has promised to bring the children of Israel back to Mount Zion here, where I'm sitting now, and says he'd be here with them forevermore. But then God asks the question, he says, why are you in travail, O daughter of Zion? Paraphrasing, of course. He asks the question, is there no king in thee? Has your counselor perished? And that's one to certainly think about. He asks these questions. But then he says, you will go out and you will dwell in the fields. So is Micah recognizing the very real possibility that yes, Jerusalem will be internationalized at the very desire that Shimon Perez has wanted to see happen? In fact, Shimon Perez, much like the son of Ahab in this case here, as a further down descendant, has brought once again idolatry into Israel, bringing the Catholic Church right on our doorsteps. And even, according to Joel Bainerman, said that they would internationalize Jerusalem, give East Jerusalem as a capital for the Palestinians, and effectively would evict the Jews from East Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. It's becoming a major problem. Now we have the Pope of Rome. The Pope of Rome is in the United States, and what is he doing there? He's not just satisfied with having Jerusalem which he is intending to make his own capital eventually, because the Palestinian people, what they're not aware of, is that the Pope of Rome is using you. He is that prince that shall come, spoken of Daniel in chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, verse 25 as well. The prince that shall come, who is of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which was Titus the Roman general. So there's coming a Roman according to Daniel's prophecy. And in chapter 11, and I think it's verse 23, please don't hold me to that, but I believe it's verse 23, he comes up strong with a small people. The Pope of Rome is only using the Palestinians for his own political gain. And unfortunately, most Palestinians don't know this. I realize there's many Palestinians that would love to live in peace with the Jewish people. And as far as the Jewish people, it's something that the Torah clearly says, if they want to live in peace with you, treat them as your brother. But now, as I said, he's not satisfied. Now he's in the United States. He's spoken with President Barack Obama in a closed-door meeting and as well spoke to both houses of Congress yesterday and today at the United Nations. When he spoke to both houses of Congress, he laid out a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, topics there that he was looking at. Some of the ones that caught my attention was his religious side there. And one of the things that he claims, he claims that there is extremisms in all religions. Of course, his New World Order agenda is, is very clear and laid out what he intends to do. He actually says in one part of this speech here, it says, such corporate, uh, cooperation is a powerful resource in the battle to eliminate new global forms of slavery born of grave injustices which can be overcome only through new policies and new forms of social consensus. Global, by the way, global consensus. You see, the Pope of Rome is pushing for a new world order and that there should be one person that is over that, one particular group that is. And of course, it's very been very clear that Pope Benedict, Pope John Paul II, and even Pope Francis now want the Vatican to actually be the head of this one world religion, one world government, a new world order, is something that's very alarming to say the very least. Another thing that he actually was into was the immigration issue. And according to what he says here on, on, his, uh, on the immigration, he claims that the displaced people are in search of a, a, a better lives for their families. He says, don't be taken back by their numbers 
don't be taken back by their numbers. It's interesting, though, he doesn't mention anything about why these people are displaced in the first place. You see, Rome, in its own military power, is NATO, that's been conquering the world and taking the lands for themselves what they wanted to do. Something that's very interesting in itself. But they've been working to conquer the entire world. It's the only way the Vatican truly can get a new world order. He has to conquer the entire globe. And this is something he's done very successfully. And all the nations are gathered there at the United Nations today. We're in complete support, standing in, in ovation to him. And even Ban Ki-moon, the head of the United Nations, actually called him Papa. Of course, everybody in the news media and both, everyone from practically every country calls him your holiness. Has he become the head of all world religions as well? Well, you know, in Revelation, it speaks about the beast and that he had blasphemed the name of God like in no other age. Yeshua pointed this out in one of the gospels written about him that's not in the actual canon of the four gospels, but we do actually have original fragments for in Aramaic. He says the one that would come and blaspheme God's name like no other would take up the name of Jesus Christ to do so. But according to Revelation, he's given power over the saints to make war with the saints and overcome them. His religious statement was, there's extremists in all religions. In other words, if you don't go along with the Vatican, they're going to conquer those saints that refuse to go along with this new world order, one world religion, and the Vatican's agenda. Even when the Charlie Hebdo case happened in France, Pope Francis actually took the side of the extremist Muslims that were the, the, the murderers in this particular case. It's unbelievable. And he says that there should not be freedom of speech in cases like this. So people like myself, many of you, that are very vocal about your opinions about the Pope, Pope, Pope Francis and the Vatican and the evils that they're planning, you would be considered an enemy to this group. Also, he's given power over every kindred, tongue, and nation. My friends, that's a new world order. Remember, as I said to you, his desire is to be the head of this. And one Catholic website I was looking at, they said there is no president as of yet to the United Nations. They put an exclamation point when they said yet. This is who they want to be the head of it all. Many people have written me and they asked me, says Steve, what about the false prophet? If truly the Pope Francis is the Antichrist, who would be the false prophet? Keep your eyes open. Those that are supporting him, that are Christians, supposedly, I have a feeling that one will rise up, maybe Masonic, maybe not, but he'll be of notoriety and he'll back the Pope. And that may be where your false prophet comes from if the Pope himself doesn't play out both sides of that himself. Anyway, I'm Stephen Benoon. We'll be going deeper into his speech. I want to get a transcript of it, break it down for you, and looking for prophecies that he has fulfilled once again in his conquest that he's done in Washington, D.C. And by the way, keep in mind, he also mentioned that in two months from now, which is a meeting that will be done in France, he'll be speaking about the things of his encyclical, the climate, global climate change. Something you need to watch out for, because this has a lot to do with the New World Order. It's just something that they've made up in order to be able to bring about a New World Order. So keep your eyes open. Many things are happening. And even though he was there laying the groundwork for a New World Order, it doesn't mean that it will actually take place at this very moment. But the groundwork has already been laid long ago, just like he declared the Palestinians already a state. He's only setting the groundwork. But that official power will take shape, possibly in the coming days, weeks, months, or even the next year or so. Then things will really get tough. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom and good evening from Israel, from the capital of Israel, Jerusalem.